Hello and welcome back to your next episode where we chat to experts and interesting people all about the issues around midlife. I'm Amy. And I'm Louise. Today we're talking to Dr. Neil Stanley, the author of How to Sleep Well. Neil is an independent sleep expert, having been involved in sleep research for over 38 years. Welcome, Neil. Good morning. Hello, how are you? Very well, thank you. Good, good. good. Okay, so just to give our listeners a little bit of a um, an introduction to you. So your website, the Sleep Consultancy. Is it the sleepconsultancy.com? It is indeed, yeah. yeah. It's full of information about all aspects of sleep and the content is based on your research, your experience and also a big dose of common sense. Common sense. Um, and I think that all shines through on your Twitter feed too and we'll put links to all of that in the show notes. Today we're going to focus on a couple of aspects and we'll talk about sleep and ageing. But first of all, I feel like I just need to put this in context that today we are recording um, at a time of great uncertainty across the world about the the uh, coronavirus. It's March 2020, just in case you're listening to this in a capsule in the future. <laughs> um, and, and a lot of people are, are genuinely worried and anxious about their elderly relatives. I mean, for many, physical contact is not possible and they're worrying about their jobs and their children's jobs and uh, the news that recently uh, GCSEs and A-levels won't be happening. So there's a lot of anxiety and um, it, it's a complex issue. And I know that people's sleep must be being affected by 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 these issues that are currently happening. So can I start with the question of like trying to help us understand what we can do to get the sleep that we need right now when we are feeling anxious or stressed about things that are clearly out of our control? Well, yeah, it, it's, it's, it's an important point that you make. Um, you know, sleep is important. We, you know, for innumerable reasons, sleep is important. Um, and one of the uh, things that sleep's important for is to ensure proper functioning of the immune system. Yeah. Uh, but it's also the time that we deal with stress and worries and concerns. So mm-hmm. it's important that we get good sleep but it's not true that sleeping more will somehow protect us more yeah it's about getting the right amount of sleep for you as an individual with regards to anxiety well simply you can't sleep if you have an anxious mind you must have a quiet mind to fall asleep if you're worrying if you're stressing if you're ruminating about problems there's no way that you're going to be able to fall asleep so what you need to do is put your worries and cares and concerns to bed before you go to bed you need to relax and wind down for about 45 minutes before bed each night and that is just doing anything that for you as an individual is calming and relaxing that can be chamomile tea yoga meditation a couple of glasses of red wine Mm -hmm. hot warm hot bath coming off facebook 45 minutes before going to bed right we absolutely just just you know shut down the world it's just not worth it and and you don't watch the late night news Mm -hmm. as you say it's an existential problem we can't do anything about it and worrying about not getting a good night's sleep is probably the biggest cause of not getting a good night's (laughs) sleep so you shouldn't be you shouldn't be seeing it as a chore as a as an achievement it should be a natural part of your day and the thing is now that most people are hopefully uh, uh, home working Mm. for the first time we have agency over our sleep we can go go to bed and get up much more in line with what our normal life would be rather than in that nine to five routine that most people have had to work in in the past. So now is the time to make sure your children develop good and healthy sleep habits because they don't have to get up so early to travel to school. And for those people who are night owls and find it difficult to get up at seven o'clock to start at nine o'clock, well, if you're working at home, you can get up at 8.55 and still start at nine o'clock. Brilliant. Just thinking about quieting our minds before bed, a couple of things I wanted to ask you about. So you said not watching the TV. I'm presuming any TV isn't isn't great. I know you said not the news. Yeah, well, you know, it, it depends. Some people fall asleep in front of the telly is that, and they is that like okay? it. So or... if, if you, if you, the, the whole thing about advice about mm. sleep is 
whatever you do, if you sleep well, don't change oh, it. Oh, okay, right. Okay. Don't change it for anybody, whether okay. they're an expert or not. Yeah, mm. it's not one size fits all, no. is it? Like Absolutely. you say, some people can fall asleep in front of Game of Thrones yep. um, on, on the on the TV. Other people are just wired by that. So do what works for you. And also, you said about having a couple of glasses of red wine. I was going to ask you a bit later on, but let's talk about it now. Alcohol. Yeah. Because well, so my personal experience and and from lots of friends that I've spoken to, as we're reaching sort of it's a midlife thing that actually alcohol is making us we might go to sleep fine you know we zonk Mm. out but then we're waking up between three and four in the morning feeling quite anxious worrying so what is the guidance with alcohol (laughs) (laughs) well there's there's the puritan wing Mm. which will tell you that any alcohol will disturb sleep Mm. and that's terrible uh there's the common sense uh wing which i very much belong to which is life is too short um and small nightcap has never hurt anybody uh, the thing with alcohol it, it were it, it's the most widely used and the most long used uh, sleep aid we've been using it for thousands of years and it's good it helps you go to sleep it actually works on the same receptors as sleeping tablets the problem with alcohol is threefold one it dehydrates you so you get the uh, you get the headache mm-hmm. two you have to get up to pee mm-hmm. and three it's highly calorific so um, you have to burn off those calories in order to get a good night sleep you actually have to lose one degree of body temperature Uh, and so if you're burning off calories either from alcohol or from a large meal that's going to make losing that uh, body temperature a lot more difficult so uh, basically a small a small sherry or a a glass of wine has never done anybody any harm if you're drinking half a bottle of value scotch uh, before you go to bed (laughs) then you've probably got more than a sleep problem Um, so uh, I, I wouldn't really want worry about it. He's so figured you it's, out, Louise. <laughs> you know, it's, it's all about moderation. I mean, you know, uh, sitting in a you know in a relaxed you know, you know company, having a glass of wine is a wonderful way to to relax, relax to yeah. end the evening. Oh. If you are sitting on your own as a nervous wreck, yeah. drinking alcohol to numb the pain, mm. um, yeah, that's probably a problem. But as I say, it's not the alcohol that's the, that's the issue there. No. So, I mean, again, it's be sensible. Some people are incredibly sensitive to alcohol. Some people aren't. Um, so if you enjoy it, don't give it up. And what about phones? To sort of quiet our minds, you know, for me, what works really well is read. Reading, um, but sometimes I read a book on an iPad. Is that okay? I mean, uh, but again, I suppose going back to what you said before, it works for me. So it, it works. I mean, I I don't read books on 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 digital devices. Mm. I always have you know my my, my actual physical uh, paper books. Mm. Um, the, the science says that um, you know you should avoid screens. One because they're exciting. So you know when when I started in sleep thirty eight years ago, the advice was don't have a TV in the bedroom. And I thought that was an amazing idea because, you know, we still only had one TV in the living room and we were paying radio rentals of a weekly price to have it. So the fact that there could be rich people who had two televisions was amazing. Um, But now, of course, it's changed. Everybody has got a device. They've got a phone, they've got a tablet, they've got a laptop. They've got a device uh, in their bedroom. Now, of course, if you've just watched The Exorcist on your uh, laptop, then you probably aren't going to fall asleep relatively easy. And then we got this idea about the blue light. Uh, Blue light, daylight is the thing that tells you to be awake. Screens give off blue light. So all the time you're looking at a screen, they are suppressing the release of melatonin. Melatonin is the body's signal to say it's time to go to bed. So if you're looking at a screen before bed, you'll find it more difficult to fall asleep. You'll have worse sleep and you'll wake up feeling sleepy. Mm -hmm. But it's not just blue light. Any light before bed is problematical. So, you know, some of the devices and some of the apps now have a night shift mode. Mm, The problem with that is it strips the blue light out, makes the screen muddy, so you turn the brightness up. That's just as bad. We also have data showing that Kindles and Paperwhite devices also disturb your sleep because it's just light at night, not specifically blue light. 
But again, if you fall asleep by reading a book on an iPad, then do not change it. It's only if you feel you have a sleep problem, and that may be the cause of it, that you need to do something about That's it. That's a really good caveat, isn't it? Like you say, if, if it ain't broke, you don't need to fix it, do you? Absolutely, and that's that's the key thing. You need to find what works for you. It's same with caffeine. You know, People talk about, oh, you know, caffeine will disturb your sleep. That is true. It will. However, we all have a very different sensitivity to caffeine. Mm. So if you've been drinking two espressos every night for the last 40 years after your evening meal... And you sleep like a baby. Sleep perfectly well, <laughs> uh, if, you just, if you then develop a sleep problem, it almost certainly will not be the caffeine. Mm. Um, so, you know, you need to work out when is the right time for you to have the last cup of coffee. Yeah. So... Start at six o'clock. If you have a cup of coffee and you feel it keeps you awake, then push it back to five. But if you fall asleep fine at you know having coffee at six o'clock, then push it to seven o'clock. Mm. You know, it only takes a couple of days to find out when is the ideal time for you to give up, you know, caffeine or alcohol or, or whatever it is, or exercise or whatever you do. Work out what's best for you. We're all different. Nobody responds the same. So there aren't these. You know, rules and regulations. There's no magic way to fall asleep. If there was, one, we'd have no problem sleeping, and two, I'd be a multi-billionaire. <laughs> um, and I'm not. So, you know, I, I would have hoped after 38 years, if it was there, I'd have discovered it. And there isn't. It's down to you. And I also read in one of your blogs, you spoke about we need sort of zero cognitive arousal as we go to sleep. You know, like the counting sheep thing, for example, would that's no good. When my, our eyes are heavy... That's when we shouldn't be clock watching and going, well, I need to go sleep now. Otherwise, I'm not going to get enough sleep because that's, you know, uh, getting your brain worrying. Absolutely. It's that anxiety about sleep. The the clocks make you do. Mm. I I read this. (laughs) Somebody called it panic maths, where you start (laughs) making those mental calculations (laughs) as to when you must get to sleep. And, you know, if you say to somebody, you know, how long did it take you to fall asleep? They'll say 30 minutes. You'll say, how do you know? And they say, well, I was looking at the clock. (laughs) And I'll say, well, you didn't have your eyes closed. You weren't really actually trying to sleep. You were lying in bed. That's a different thing. So this is about this is the thing. There was a study done by Alison Harvey uh, at Oxford University a number of years ago now that shows that counting sheep, because you are counting, is cognitive arousal. Mm. You are waking yourself up by counting sheep. So she suggested that you should imagine a tranquil scene. You know, it's like a postcard scene, right. and that is the thing that you should be thinking of and of course that's difficult you know because if you do take your worries to bed it's difficult so if you are worrying have a pen and paper beside your bed then you can write the worries down so you don't have to worry about them anymore or use a distraction technique like imagining a a story that's that's interesting for you but not emotionally important or emotionally involving Mm. that you can think about that rather than thinking about your worries for instance i do a lot of flying backwards and forwards to the to europe i used to um (laughs) and um so the so you know a lot of that was on Ryanair 737. So I imagined that I was rich enough to have a 737, and how would I configure the the seating pattern and the bedrooms on that? Now that's never going to happen. It's of interest and it can last as long as you like. Yeah. So that's what's worked for me. That's you know, it might not work for you, yeah. um, but you know, don't you know, don't think about oh, you know, if I won a hundred million on the Euro lottery, what who would I give money to? Because then you get down to the nitty gritty where you actually hated your aunt Brenda because she only gave you a pair of socks when you were seven years old, and so she's not going to get any money, and that's going to start you <laughs> having an emotional engagement anyway. So use find something that you can you can think about. You know, think you've you've got the you know the set list for Glastonbury, and you can have any band you like on, or, or I. I don't know. Whatever works for you. Okay. So, sort of like a menial mental task almost. Yeah. You know, and, and you know, there, there's been many of these over the years. I mean, there, there's, there was a book from the 1950s that listed hundreds of these. And one of my favourite ones was uh, list all the operas alphabetically oh. that you've seen. I can't see that actually working now. I was going to say, it would take me about 30 seconds. Yeah. So, but, yeah, so there was, there was things like that, or, you know, a, you know, A for aardvark, B for buffalo, that sort of things, or subtract seven from a thousand repeatedly. But, again, those are those actually require yeah, you yeah. to do a bit of thought, and, you know, if you get stuck, 
then you're going to panic about not being able to complete the task. So that's where, why a story is perhaps more uh, more beneficial, shall we say. What do you think about um, podcasts, like almost soporific podcasts um, or, you Audio know, bed, book or... bedtime books? Or... Well, I, I, again, it, it's I love reading. Um, and I, I love reading, you know, uh, you know intelligent books and magazines and, and I, you know, I keep up with the news, but I can't abide listening to Radio 4. Mm. It drives me mental. I can't, you know, I, I can't, I either sit there and listen to it and I can't do anything else, mm. or if I'm doing something else, I won't be listening to it. So again, it's down to you if you like that. I mean, you know, remember somebody once said, one man's relaxation is another man's torture. Yeah. Um, you know, if if the story is so dull that you're not listening to it, mm. then you don't need the story. Mm. And if the story is interesting, you'll listen to yeah. it. Yeah, yeah. You know, yeah. I, and and personally, I mean, you, you know, the idea of an actor, a famous actor with a famous voice, reading me a story about walking through a lavender field in France. I, I don't care. Do you, do you know what I mean? Mm. I'm not going to be interested in listening to that in the first place. No. I mean, although I did think that um, all before all this happened, I did think Richard Burton ringing, reading the telephone directory <laughs> would be perfect. I mean, I, I think that. But again, I like Richard Burton's voice. Yes, you know, yes. if you don't. Um, then it's not so again it comes down if it works for you it's fine but there's no magic no. wand that people can wave over you to put you to sleep and and i think am i right in also thinking you know if you you're going back to that you know when you're you know you're ready to go to sleep you've got all that in place and then you close your eyes and you are maybe visualizing something to stop you going back to your worries uh, it's almost like is that something we have to train ourselves to do a little bit it's quite hard to switch off your worries it is it is but as i say you should have a, a a nice relaxing routine mm. you should you know the only way to get to sleep is to put your brain and body in the position to sleep a relaxed body a quiet mind um if you do that going to sleep is like falling off a log yeah it really isn't complex no. you close your eyes you go to sleep and we've 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 made it complex we've made it scary we've yeah, and we've forgotten that actually it really is a relatively easy thing. So it's not really training yourself. No. It's just remembering. You know, how do you fall? I mean, a good question to ask yourself is how do you feel? How do you sleep when you're on holiday? And most people say, oh, I sleep brilliant. Well, one, you're in a, you know, a foreign environment. Two, you're on a bed that's not your bed. And yet you sleep well. Yeah. Why? Mm. Because it's not your life. Yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. it's... I'm not saying, you know, sit under an umbrella in your living room with a pina colada, but <laughs> I am saying that some of the things you don't do on holiday, you shouldn't be doing in the hour before you go to right. bed, if, if okay. you see what I mean. Yeah. What about people who have no trouble getting to sleep, but then they wake up between three and four in the morning? Why does that happen? Is, is it just anxiety or is it... it, it, it <laughs> and what should we age, do when that happens? Yeah. Age is, is the cause okay. of that. Right. Uh, okay. Essentially what happens, um, you know, to, children sleep forever, anywhere, no problem. Mm. They wake up, they fall back to sleep, they have no idea, they just do it. Uh, teenagers need to sleep a long time because of puberty and emotional uh, changes, physical changes they're going through, they need a lot of sleep. But around the age of about 25 or so, at the latest, your sleep need becomes fixed for life. So it's not true that as we get older, we need less sleep. Oh, what happens is our sleep becomes lighter. We start losing the deepest sleep, what we call the N3 stage sleep, the deep, slow wave sleep. We start losing that as we get older, which means two things. One, as we get older, our sleep becomes less refreshing. So however much you sleep, you don't wake up feeling, you know, on top form like you did when you were 20. You know, when you were 20, you... You, you know, you, you got home, you went to bed, you died for nine hours, you woke yeah. up and you mm. felt wonderful. Well, that doesn't happen anymore. So that's the first change. And, of course, that makes people think, well, maybe I've got a sleep problem. The other change with this deep sleep, children have loads of deep sleep. Children sleep anywhere, through anything. If they wake up, they can go straight back to sleep. So if you don't have this deep sleep, you're going to be more easily woken up. And when you are awake, 
there's no pressure for you to go back to sleep. Mm. So when you were 20, you got up, you had a pee, you got back into bed, you fell straight back to sleep. And if somebody said to you, how did you sleep? You say, fine. Mm. When you get more than 20, <laughs> um, you wake up for a pee, you get up, you have a pee, you get back into bed and you're lying there for an hour thinking, this is nice. Um, and that's it. And if you're lying there and it's dark and it's quiet and there's nothing to distract you, that's the time that your worries and your con concerns can flood in. Yeah. So that is what changes as we get older. Now, this change, there is a, a sex difference. Men start losing their slow wave sleep from around the age of 35 or so. Women from around the age of 55 or so. Oh, so interesting. As we get older, this is why men's memories start going, because sleep is, of course, involved with memory and learning. Mm -hmm. And it's also why men over the age of 60 generally have worse sleep than age-matched women. So that's there's an important sex difference there. So... Really, the only thing that you can do is look at what may be waking you up. Mm -hmm. So is it needing to pee? Mm -hmm. Is it your partner uh, snoring or moving, okay. um, which it is often. Uh, I, I published the first paper of its type in 2005 showing much of your sleep disturbance is caused by your bed partner. Mm -hmm. And then if you are awake for 20 minutes in the middle of the night, and you still can't fall back to sleep, get up, do something else in another room and oh. go back to bed when you feel sleepy again. If you still haven't fallen asleep after another 20 minutes, get up, do something else, go back to bed when you're sleepy again. Because there's no point lying in bed. If you For lie hour, in bed, yeah. hour, because you're going to hate your pillow, you're going to hate your duvet, you're going to hate your mattress, you're going to hate the person sleeping next to you because they're asleep and they don't care about you. Mm -hmm. Um and, and so what's the point? You're just going to get ever more frustrated, which is going to lead to those ever more worries, et cetera, et cetera. So you have to break the cycle. If you can and you sleep on your own, switch the light on and read, which is what I do. Oh, okay. uh, but if, if you're together uh, and you mm. feel that that's going to disturb your bed partner, then I say... Do it anyway. Go, <laughs> do it anyway. Uh, absolutely. Go to another room. And, you know, you're awake. So listen to the radio, have a cup of tea or something relaxing. And when you feel sleepy again, go back to bed and, and, and you know, you should sleep. You need, you need, even actually many people find just getting up and going to the bathroom. A lot of midnight bathroom trips don't, aren't because your bladder is so distended that you'll wet yourself. It is actually just a reason to get up. The bed feels strangely more comfortable. And if you flip the pillow, it's even better. So it's cooler. So it helps you lose that body heat we talked about earlier. So so the, there are all those things that you can do. But as I say, lying there getting ever more frustrated will just lead to increased worry, which again will stop you from getting to sleep. Am I right in thinking that, you know, we need to sort of mentally associate our bedroom just with sleeping and it being a sanctuary? So if you're lying there, then that would disturb that. Am I right in uh, that? I've read yeah, that absolutely. somewhere. So. Absolutely. It's called stimulus control. And the idea is that the bedroom is where you sleep. What's very, very interesting is all the Germanic languages that feed into English call it the sleep room. We call it the bedroom. And I think sleep rooms are much better better concept oh, yes that is interesting isn't it because you know the the bedroom is just where you have the bed the sleep room is where you sleep so your your sleep room is not your office it's not your gym it's not your games room it's not your cinema it is the sleep room you go into the bedroom to sleep and as you say you do not want to associate the um the bedroom, the sleep room, with being awake, because then you have this conditioned arousal. It, you know, you you know, and this is why you can fall asleep on the settee. Uh, then, when you get up and you go to the bedroom, you can't fall asleep mm -hmm. because you've been conditioned that it's okay to be awake in the bedroom by you know working or, or watching movies, etc. So definitely, you reserve the bedroom for sleep, uh, pretty much exclusively. Um, that that's the only activity. So really, the bedroom should be dark, quiet, cool, comfortable, pretty minimalist. So you know, a bed, a bedside table, a bedside light, and that's pretty much it. That's quite interesting because obviously at this time when people are going to be working from home, it probably is quite tempting to do the 8.55 wake up and go straight on to a nine o'clock call in your bed. But but 
try and resist the temptation to do that. That's what you're yeah. saying. Like, get, get, use a different room for for Absolutely. For working. You, you have your home office um, and then have your bedroom. They're not the same thing. Even if you just, I mean, you know, I'm working from home and my bedroom is, you know, three steps from uh, where my computer is. But that's it. This is my office. I have my computer. I have my printer. And even if it's just that three steps, mm. it's enough to make the bedroom, the separate. bedroom, yeah. sleep room. It has to be separate. Now, I'd like to ask you about sleep during the menopause or perimenopause. Yep. Many women um, report hot uh, flushes during the yep. day, but also at night that disturb their sleep. What can they do about that? Well, I mean, what, what's interesting about that is that there was a, a paper that came out, uh, I think, just earlier this year, actually, that, that showed that it's all down to temperature. The sleep disturbance in menopause, perimenopause, is all about the disturbance to the body temperature. And as I said uh, earlier, we need to lose one degree of body temperature in order to get uh, a good night's sleep. Mm -hmm. um, now, if you are internally uh, producing heat uh, mm. on a frequent basis, that's going to make that loss of body temperature so much more difficult. Um, and that's what disturbs your sleep in, in that regard. All you can then do is do anything that can uh, reduce the increase in heat, if that makes sense. So have the bedroom a bit cool. Uh, don't share a duvet. Have single duvets uh, so you, you're not you're not heating your partner up or you're not fighting to keep your temperature mm -hmm. uh, use natural fibers so cotton to wick away the moisture um, or silk uh, use you know uh, foam is an insulator so a lot of people who have a foam bed when they mm -hmm. Uh, go through the menopause, find out that they really do sleep very, very hot on those beds. So, you know, a, 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 a natural fibre mattress, a pillows, duvets uh, and, and, and bed clothes, um, you know, have a thinner duvet than you'd expect to on or even just a sheet over you. Don't do anything before bed that further increases your body temperature. So don't exercise too close to bed. Uh, don't eat huge meals fatty sugary meals or you know drink too much alcohol before bed because i say that's just going to you know be additional to the problem of losing heat so it's all about temperature management um and and this might be an ideal time to you know sleep separately from your partner because let's be honest they're just one big cuddly hot water bottle anyway <laughs> um and so you know it might be better so if you are disturbed at night if you're in your own bed then you don't have to worry about lying still or not fidgeting or, or tossing and turning and that might wake your partner up if you're in your own bed then one you can have the temperature set to what you like and you don't have to compromise with another person it does sound like from what you said earlier about um, sleeping with somebody else as well that actually probably we'd all sleep a lot better if we just slept on our own and I suppose that's something to think about um, and I suppose it, it just means you're gonna have to be a little bit more creative about you know, when Getting you're together. shagging each other. So, <laughs> well, um... <laughs> yeah. well, I mean, you know, the, the, the thing is, there's a huge amount of, uh, you know, history behind this. Humans are the only animals that sleep together for intimacy. And this only started happening in the Victorian era. But... Before that, it was only ever poor people who slept together because they didn't have space. Right. Uh, so they were forced together. But it was only in the Victorian era when Victorian men wished to have more sex with their wives. Mm. And so they pushed the child out into a nursery and installed themselves into the bed. Mm. That's it. So it's only a very modern construct. And, you know, up until sort of 1935, twin beds were the norm, not double beds. Right. And as I say, most of your sleep disturbance is caused by your bed partner. And the thing is, sleeping together is a compromise. You know, you you have to in some way compromise your behaviour for them. But sleep is the most selfish thing you do. You can't share your sleep with anybody. 
So nobody ever falls asleep in each other's arm. No. You have a cuddle, you get pins and needles, and then you turn to opposite sides of the bed. Why don't you then go to your bedroom, not the back bedroom, not the spare bedroom, not the guest bedroom, but your bedroom, which is done out the way you want, get a good night's sleep, then you'll be happier, healthier, more, you know, not wanting to kill your bed partner, and then you'll be much more in the yeah. mind for snuggles. Probably going to yeah. lead to more sex, in fact, actually. Well, yeah. well there's, a, there's, there's an Italian sociologist called Renfretti who published a paper called The Geography of, of Intimacy, and he shows that we only have sex just before we go to sleep in bed because it's the only time you happen to be together mm. and behind closed doors. It's got nothing to do with feeling randy or being in the best <laughs> mental or physical condition. It's, it's, just it's because, mere convenience. <laughs> yeah, and that really robs the, uh, robs the romance out mm. of it. It's far better to tiptoe down the hall, you know, the, the, the landing for snuggles mm. than have an arm thrown across you because you happen to be happen there. Happen to be there? <laughs> Oh, well, now you've put it like that, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I wanted to ask you about daytime naps, power naps, people call them. Yes or no? What do you think? A 20-minute nap will boost your performance by up to 20% for about three to four hours. So if you need a boost during the day, then fine. If you're sleeping for more than 20 minutes during the day, then you're probably going to be eating up your sleep need during the night. So if you have a two-hour sleep during the day, you're going to not need as much sleep at night, which may lead you to w wake up early and think you've got a sleep problem or, or whatever. Oh, okay. So, yeah. But again, it works for you. Somebody once said to me, is it okay to have an afternoon nap? And I said, as long as you're not a school bus driver yeah <laughs> <laughs> would you mind um me asking how old you are neil and how well you sleep I, i'm 54 years old uh and i sleep really really quite well as i say i've been in sleep research and sleep medicine for 38 years so if i don't do it now uh i'll never do it so i'm i think i'm the only sleep expert in the world who on their website actually puts every piece of information about my sleep because if I'm going to preach to you I've got to practice what I preach and you can see whether I'm a hypocrite or not yeah. Um, so yeah no I do everything I can I know I need eight, uh, nine and a half hours sleep a night to feel at my best and I prioritise it and uh, I'm one of the few people I think in the world who's still left who actually sees going to bed as one of the best parts of the day <laughs> oh, God, no, I agree with you I'm totally with you absolutely <laughs> but do, do you think there are I guess there are some people who just need less sleep they you know, uh, for example, yeah. my, my two children are so different. My son is just, he just loves his bed. He just snuggles it. And my daughter will fight it till the absolute last moment. She's such a, you know, she, she just needs less sleep. Yeah, I mean, you know, sleep need is like hype. We're all different and it's genetically determined. So some people need and can thrive on four hours sleep. Now, they're very rare, but they mm. exist. Others need 10, 11 hours sleep to feel at the best. Um, so it's about getting the right amount of you. And the, the right amount of sleep for you is very, very easily worked out. Essentially, if you're awake, alert and focused during the day, you've had enough sleep. Right. If you feel sleepy during the day, you haven't. And mm. sleepy is not feeling tired, not feeling miserable or cheesed off with the world. Sleepy is if you climbed up three flights of stairs, do you need a sit down or asleep. If you mm. need to sit down, you're tired, fatigued, knackered, exhausted. If you need to sleep, you're sleepy. So I say, if you feel fine at 11 o'clock during the day, you know, focused, alert, you've had enough sleep. Don't worry about how many hours, care how it makes you feel during the day. Right. So I know this probably does link into other things as well, but you know when you, do you have that sort of two or three o'clock lull like a bit of yeah. a crash. I need to go and get a double decker from the news agent. Do you know what I'm saying? <laughs> yeah, it's a post lunch dip, um, which you don't actually need to have lunch to experience. Mm. Essentially, it goes back to what Noel Coward sang about Mad Dogs and Englishmen go out in the midday sun. <laughs> you know, at the height of the midday sun, it is too hot to do anything. Yeah. So it's far easier, and you see this all across, you know, Asia and Africa, it's far easier to go somewhere shady and not have to work or hunt. And if you've gone somewhere shady, not have to work or hunt, you might as well have a kip. We have this hangover, evolutionary hangover. We still have that dip. Mm. Uh, between about two and four o'clock in the afternoon, which is when, you know, a 20-minute nap would help. 
Uh, but it's, as I say, it's perfectly natural. And they say it's got nothing to do with food. You'll get it whether you've had lunch or not. Oh, mm. oh, Interesting. Okay. Because, yeah, I was thinking about working from home as well. I, I saw on Twitter somewhere, somebody said, uh, was asking for tips for working from home. And someone said her greatest tip was not to have any carbs at lunchtime because it will make you tired. But you're saying it's not to do with the food. It's, so No, I mean, no. I mean, of course, you know, if you've if you've had a big relaxing meal... Mm then, of course, you want to relax after it. Yeah. You know, if you think about it. Um, but, it, you know, it doesn't cause you to be sleepy. It causes you to want to sit and rest. You know, but, you know, nobody has... You know, the idea that you have an hour-long lunch break and you go out and have three courses, which is what it was like when I was started work back in 82, <laughs> that's gone. You know, the idea, you know, most people have a sandwich and I bet you even people at home, home working, will have a sandwich yeah. at their desk. Mm. They may have made the sandwich rather than getting it from a coffee shop, but I'm sure nobody is going to take this opportunity to think, sod it, they don't pay me for an hour for lunch, I'm going to have an hour for lunch. Mm. It's not going to happen, it's no. just not any more ingrained in our culture. OK, so finally, Neil, the question we ask um, all of our guests over 40, what's great about this stage of your life? I, 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 think, this is the, I think this is the best stage of life. You, 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 you've got rid of the, uh, the, the foolishness of youth uh, and you start realising what's important. And, you know, so many people search for happiness, but I, my, my biggest learning is that happiness is transient. Contentment is forever. So I've decided, uh, you know, to be content to you know not not strive to be you know fabulously wealthy or anything like that but just to you know have a partner who loves me go for nice long walks and be happy together and, and that you know you, you want so much when you're young and then you, you realize that you're never going to get it so you can either fight against it or accept it and i've accepted it i i'm, I'm enjoying life now than I, more than i've ever done before oh, oh that's, that's wonderful that's it? wonderful thank you so much neil for giving us your time today Thanks, it's been Neil. a pleasure. Thanks Thank you very much. Thank you. Cheers. Thank you. Made by DarkHorseDigital.co.uk. Shooting, live streaming, and podcast production.